I'm Dave. And I'm Andrew, and we are the IB English Guys. And today we are going to revisit the line of inquiry for the higher level essay in response to many comments and direct messages we've had on the channel. Uh, David, tell us what we're going to do today. Well, first of all, it's Sunday morning, and you and I are both here, and this is crazy. But here we go. We're going to talk about the line of inquiry, and we're going to talk about Last, many of our videos have looked at lines of inquiry and the final product, but this time we're going to look at the process. But we're going to talk about the signature moves by the author. One of my favorite signature things to moves. Talk this about. guy loves signature moves, folks. Yeah. Just a quick reminder: of course, the higher level essay is twelve to fifteen hundred words. Uh, we think you should be closer to fifteen hundred. Uh, and the components of a good line of inquiry are as follows: uh, you have a question word, the author, the text, genre literary linguistic aspect, rich ideas, and a precise context. Mr. Jaws, would you like to read a sample line of inquiry uh, so students and teachers can see what we're making today? Yeah, that's, this is one for Lang and Lit. This is a documentary. How does director Ava DuVernay use archival footage and photos, as well as allusions to history, to convey the legacy of slavery and systemic racism in modern-day United States in her provocative documentary, 13? Holy mackerel. It's long, but it's grammatically correct. We see a question word. We see uh, DuVernay's name. We see the rich literary or linguistic aspect. In this case, of course, it's a cin cinematic feature. Cinematic, yeah, cinematic uh, aspect. Got rich ideas, a precise context, the genre, of course, a documentary and the title. So these are the components we want to put in our line of inquiry for today. Last time, of course, we started with the text and the rich idea. Today, we're going to start with the text and go for the signature move and try to work to our line of inquiry. That's right. You ready, Giles? So we're going to think about what do we what what moves does the author make that we can then turn into a rich idea. All right, you're so cheating. Let's go. I, I see you've already brought your text, I but, I'll, my book. but I'll ask Hurry the first up, question. Ask the question. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Mr. Giles, what is the text in our two year program that we have studied together as a class with our teacher that you love? Yeah, I love The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy, one of my favorite novels to teach and one of my favorite novels to read. Okay, Mr. Giles, it's 7 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Tell me, uh, what are some <laughs> signature moves? There's a new question, folks. What are some signature moves that Arundhati Roy makes as an author in this text? Yeah, this is what's so creative about this novel. First of all, we see a nonlinear structure, narrative structure. Uh, i got to write these things down. Sorry, yeah. okay. So the nonlinear narrative structure. Uh, do we see anything else? Yeah, we see also the way she subverts the English language. She changes the rules of grammar and punctuation and capitalization. I like that. Okay, uh, changing sort of English grammar rules, right? Yeah. So, so far, you like the structure. Uh, these, so you've got nonlinear structure, you've got English grammar, anything else that she does with language or craft that really make her yeah. stand up. We talk about signature moves because they're unique to her. They That's really right. define her as a writer. So what are some other things you talked about with your teacher? She also uses childlike diction, the childlike sort of almost narrative perspective by using language so we can see that it's seen through the eyes of a child. I really like that as a signature move. I got one more. All right, man, it's your show. So tell me, what's your fourth one? <laughs> my fourth one, and there are other ones, but my other one is the way she used it. Hey, hey, sit up straight. Come on, I'm we're sorry. working here. Okay? I know I'm relaxing. I'm trying okay. to be, I was trying to be relaxed, actually, because I'm always jumping in. I think she uses intertexts. And by intertext, it's more than just an illusion. It's a reference to a literary work that's that's really a part of the that's, that's integrated into the narrative. An intertext. All right. So rather than starting with an idea, folks, this time we're starting with features. You've said that things that make Arundhati Roy unique in this text are nonlinear structure, use of grammar, sort of how she subverts rules, childlike diction, and intertext. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, the HLE calls for a broad linguistic or literary perspective. Is Do one of those really stand out as something you'd like to explore? Uh, I'm an, I, I, I would say the intertexts. I think that's really an interesting thing to talk about. I, I think allusions are fun to talk about, but the intertexts uh, really stand out to me. Of course, folks, as the person questioning him, I'm keeping track of what he's saying just on a little piece of paper here. So I want to try to ask questions based on these answers. Okay. You're focusing on intertext, intertextuality. In this novel, Giles... Are there moments where we see Arundhati Roy using intertext? Can you yeah. think of any precise moments in the text? Sure. Well, I think about precise intertext. So, for example, we see the heart of darkness as an intertext. Okay. Uh, we also see uh, The Great Gatsby. We see Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Hold on, hold on, Gatsby. God, you're Sorry, fast. Okay, Jungle Book. Few. All right, got another and one. Lastly, we see The Sound of Music. Ooh, yeah. So these are four intertexts as as well as other ones, 
that she uses that help to emphasize themes. And each one of those is probably a different theme or different idea. Hey, who's asking the questions here? Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, I want to stay with that. I love this. Now you focused on sort of this literary aspect of intertextuality, intertext, you got the sound of music. Can you describe to me the moment in the text, what's happening when we, the reader, see this intertext sound of music? What's happening? Yeah, so The Sound of Music is a really powerful film that's made in 1969, and this is uh, when the children are young. And this is a very pivotal scene. I think it's chapter four, where we see that the family is going to see The Sound of Music, and we see uh, a really uh, traumatic incident that takes place. And the way the sound of music is integrated into that chapter and the way that it emphasizes different themes and ideas is really powerful to me. All right, so you're talking about trauma, sound of music, and you keep saying the word idea. So I, I'm gonna have to, now we've got the feature. We've got, we've got this idea of intertext. We've got a precise moment, sound of music. We've got this notion of trauma. What do you think that Arundhati Roy is saying in, in this particular text? Through this, through this particular moment, Arundhati Roy communicates the idea that... Okay. I think this text is a post-colonial novel, and it's dealing with post-colonial Indian identity and the, the feelings of inferiority felt by uh, post-colonial post, uh, uh, India. And this is, again, what Arundhati Roy is exploring. So this Hang sound, on. I've, I've just yeah. written down the words post-colonial India. I've written down identity, and I've written down inferiority. Those are just some key words I jotted down as you were speaking. Yeah, and I think when you think about that moment, we see the young boy looking at the sound of music and comparing the characters in this Western film, this sort of ideal Hollywood uh, film that's made, uh, and the way that, that contrasts his own feelings about himself and his own feelings about his family and perhaps his country and his culture. So, all right, pretty you're, powerful. You're, yeah, you're kind of, you're, you're coming out with a lot of stuff here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're making this quite difficult, but that's okay. <laughs> country and culture. Mr. Giles, okay, uh, what I've got right now is I've got this literary aspect of intertext. I've got sound of music. I've got ideas, post-colonial identity, inferiority, country, culture. Mm. Do you want to play with some of these words and try to craft a line of inquiry? Or do yeah. you think you're ready? I, I think I'm ready because I've got my literary, my signature move is that intertext of sound of music. All right. I'm right. going to move over to the computer for so, this one and help you jot this so down. So I'm thinking about, I want to really write my higher level essay about the intertext of the sound of music. This is again, the literary perspective. All right. That's, that's interesting to me. So how does uh, Arundhati Roy uh, utilize, the, the, I want to use the word intertext, the intertext of uh, the sound of music. Okay. The, yeah, I can say the film Sound of Music. Okay. Um, to reflect. Ooh, okay. I want to get into that. that maybe Remember, your key words are post colonial India, you've got identity, inferiority, country, and culture. I could talk about to reflect um, feelings of inferiority felt by post-colonial India. Yes, okay. Or if I wanted to not be so specific to inferiority, I could talk about to reflect the post-colonial Indian identity. That might be enough. Okay. That would, that would allow me to talk about different aspects of post-colonial India. So where we are now is what you've just said through this line of questioning is how, is this, how does Arundhati Roy utilize the intertext of sound and music to reflect feelings of inferiority in post-colonial India? Yeah. Is that okay for you? Yeah, I like that. Okay. That's uh, interesting. I think it's interesting as well. Uh, let me just quickly light it up. We've got the how, we've got the question word, we've got the author, we've got the literary aspect intertext, we've got the name of the work, Sound of Music. Uh, we don't have the name of this particular novel, The God of Small Things. We need to get that in there, Giles. Yeah, I think you put it at the end of the sentence. Okay. Or, or you could say, how does she, uh, you know, in, in her novel, uh, The God of Small Things. Sure. So we'll add that in there here at the end, at in the, the novel, God of Small Things. All right, Mr. Giles. So... Uh, would you, as a student, just start working on this essay, or would you, do you think you might try this again? Honestly, what would you do as a student in this spot? Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think I would have to really start outlining. I was like, okay, what are the different aspects of Indian, post-colonial Indian identity I want to talk about, and how can I then organize my thoughts? Well, luckily, you've given me plenty of other moments. Uh, you know, you've talked about intertextuality other times in our conversation. I think that's not going to be too hard for you. Folks, the main takeaway for today's video is as follows. In our last video, we arrived at our line of inquiry by starting with our text and then a rich idea and then identifying the literary aspect. How is this video different, Giles? 
we started with thinking about the signature moves made by the, the writer. So we're thinking about that literary aspect we want to look at. And then we work back to the idea. Back to the idea. Okay. In the end, folks, we think both of these strategies will work well for you as students and teachers in your classrooms. And we really hope that this process, showing you this metacognitive process, really illuminates how you, in your class with your peers, can arrive at a good line of inquiry. Giles, send us away. Yeah. Hey, if you like the video, like it, subscribe, subscribe to the channel and share it out with others. We want to keep this project alive. And thank you so much for listening. And please give us some comments and we will continue to, to work for you. Well, thanks done. guys. Bye everyone.